interesting. Uh, this is something I saw on the train one morning. And, uh, and so it's always uh, easy when you know what you're looking for. Now, I'm sure a lot of people looked at this uh, advertisement for concerts uh, at the uh, uh, Academy of Music. But what I want you to notice is that the, there is no September 31st, right? So a lot of times you have to know what you're looking for. Now, there were this, this uh, children's game where uh, uh, you sort of figure out how many uh, things are wrong with the picture. So you can see you know, that the, this chair is about to fall over and uh, the sink is overflowing. But a lot of times uh, radiology is like that as well, where we have to try to figure out the number of things that are wrong with an image. This was a caricature done by an artist named Hirschfield, and he used to put next to his name a number, which would indicate how many times in the image the name of his daughter Nina would appear. So he would hide them. Now, if you looked at this image at first, you might say, well, I see one there and I see one there and quit because that, that's what's called satisfaction of search. But he tells you that there's three of them in the image. So you have to just keep looking, sort of tucked in here. So the thing we don't have in radiology is knowing when to quit. So in this case, it's easy to see there's a metastatic lesion here, there's a metastatic lesion there, and there's a metastatic lesion there. But before we pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, look at all the things I found wrong with this image, you have to keep looking until you see the fact that there's enhancement in the inner penuncular cistern and there is uh, enhancement in the left auditor internal auditory canal, which indicates that this patient has carcinomatous meningitis. So these are the challenges for imaging, but we don't really know how many things to look for. Now, the reason I've been focusing on artifacts is they contribute to the uncertainty in imaging and add to the number of false positives on imaging. And what's uh, created more problems is that as CT has become even more complicated uh, and our use of multiplanar reconstruction, it's made it harder to recognize a lot of these artifacts. So I want to go through a few of these today with you. Uh, the first is uh, beam hardening. And variation of that is photon starvation. We'll talk about electronic angulation and motion. And I'm not sure we'll have time for these, but we'll get started with beam hardening. Probably the most common artifact you see on CT imaging. Remember that the KVP on the image, so when we describe the scan as being done at 120 uh, uh, KVP, that means the peak energy is 120, but the mean energy is about half that, depending on the filters. So as that beam, goes through, and let's say for brain imaging, the skull, the low energy photons or x-rays are disproportionately attenuated. So the beam is different on one side of the head than the other. So it, when it enters the skull, it has sort of a full complement of energies. But as it leaves the other side, it, it actually has fewer of the low energy photons. So the mean energy has gone up. And that creates problems on imaging. So for example, in this image, if you measure the attenuation here inside the cella, it's minus 20 Hounsfield units, which is the, the close to that of fat. But we know there's no fat in the cella. So this is a beam hardening artifact caused by the fact that the beam, particularly areas where there's bone around it, the scanner is fooled into thinking that the tissues in the center have a lower attenuation than they really have. And so we see the same thing here. It looks like there's an infarct in the cerebellum, but again, this is a beam hardening artifact caused by the skull around this portion of the brain. Same way here. It looks like there's low attenuation of the cortex bilaterally in this patient with a pretty thick skull, but this is a variation of beam hardening. So in a sense, because the exiting beam has quite a bit of, uh, the mean energy is quite high, the detectors think that the, uh, that the patient had something low attenuation in the center. So it arbitrarily assigns some low energy, low attenuation essentially. These are dramatically seen here between the petrous bone. This is the intrapetrous artifact. And here you see a little bit over here where we have a thick skull and this sharp line and low attenuation uh, on the other side should lead you to the notion of beam hardening. Here's another artifact. These are all beam hardening artifacts. Now, when we reconstruct the scans that is done quite commonly now, 
you can see it looks like there's a lesion in the ponds. There's low attenuation in the ponds. But this is, again, due to this beam parting artifact seen now in a reconstruction. Here it is in the axial image. Easier to recognize here, harder to recognize here. So always look back to your source imaging. This is also uh, called a cupping artifact. Even when you have an even phantom, the, the uh, assigned attenuation values drop in the center has to do with the way that the scan is reconstructed. And so there's an a effect called a cupping correction where the scanner anticipates this problem and adds a little bit of attenuation in the center. And this can create its own problems. But again, this is, uh, in this case, this is not a subdural over here. This is a beam hardening artifact. This is what happens when there's an overcorrection of beam hardening, is it makes it look like it's high attenuation rather than low attenuation. So again, this is a kind of a double artifact because here we're seeing uh, the effects of the correction. Here you can see it again over here. Very much looks like a subdural, but this is an artifact. So this is called uh, overcorrection. Now, metal creates uh, in the same way uh, a, an artifact, but this is somewhat different because this is not just from an upshift in the mean energy of the X-ray beam. This is an actual occlusion or sort of attenuation of the X-ray beam itself. And so in this case, this is a patient unfortunately was shot and this is a lead bullet. And you can see these artifactual areas of low attenuation and high attenuation coming from the bullet. I mean, what do we use to uh, prevent x-rays from uh, uh, hurting uh, the operator or a patient in the course of a scan? We give them a lead apron. So lead is very good at attenuating x-rays. So when you're dealing with a lead farm body, you get almost no x-rays traverse that region. And so the scanner has to make up things. So this is all artifact arising from a bullet that's probably about this size. So this artifact, I think, is better described as photon starvation. Photon, sort of the interchangeable term for an x-ray, but this is just not enough information to make an image. Here's an even more dramatic one. So these are photon starvation artifacts. I think, technically speaking, not really uh, beam hardening. Now, this is a patient scanned at two energies. This is a technique called dual energy. And so here you can see there's an X-ray clip and you'll notice that the low energy, the, the photon starvation artifact is larger than it is at high energy. And that's because at the higher energy, more X-rays are able to go through this titanium clip to give you more information. Here we have less information because more of the X-rays are being stopped by the clip. And the composition of the metal matters. Here's a the, here's the clip. And look how very little information you can determine from the metal. It just looks like an area of streaks and kind of a bland white area. Now this clip, you can actually see the blades and the spring. This clip is made of cobalt, a cobalt alloy clip. This is a titanium clip. And remember on the periodic table that titanium is sort of in the range of aluminum. And so it allows the x-rays to go through the metal so we get enough information that we can reconstruct an image. So here's our periodic table. And so if we look here, here's uh, gold and, uh, and uh, platinum. These are pretty high on the scale. Here's lead. So these attenuate x-rays to a large degree. Uh, but if we look over here, here's titanium, quite much, much lower in the periodic table and more likely that you'll be able to see through it with the CT scan. Here's a phantom we did years ago, and here you can see we scanned. This is a cobalt alloy clip, and you can see how the artifacts obscure any detail around the clip. These are titanium clips, and you can actually see the spring and the blades of the clip. So again, uh, the metal type of metal matters. Now on that same theme, this, was, uh, uh, this area of high attenuation was seen here on the neck, and here's another one seen in the region of the eye. And in these cases, the reader suggested that there might be some risk in having an MR scan. But if you're discerning about imaging, you realize that there's no artifacts arising from these uh, opacities. Just as I showed you here, look at all the artifacts that came from the metal. Whereas these on, C, on CT 
have very little artifacts, which tells you that this is probably not metal. Uh, it, we said maybe titanium or aluminum, but, but certainly not a ferrous metal that would keep you from an MR scan. If you look on the plain film though, you notice it doesn't look like metal at all. This is a fragment of glass and glass because of the silicone probably in the glass, it actually has a relatively high attenuation, but certainly not as high as uh, metal. And so again, the fact that you have no real streak artifacts arising from these opacities should lead you to the conclusion that it's probably not metal that you're looking at. And the way you scan matters. This is a scan done axially and this is helical. Those are two different techniques used for CT scanning. And you'll see that this has more artifact when you scan helically. This is sometimes called a windmill artifact, typical for helical imaging. Now let's look at this artifact. This one, it appears to come out of nowhere, sort of appears here in the middle of the head, here sort of in the back of the head. Now usually we can tell where these artifacts arise, but in this case, it, it looks as though it sort of comes out of nowhere. Now, how, how can that be? This has to do with this phenomenon of electronic angulation. So early CT scanners, like back in the 80s, it took such a long time for each slice that the head was scanned at an angle that required the fewest number of slices. But as the scanner speed improved, uh, that we kept this angulation. And to this day, many places review their scans in that angle. Now the newer scanners, they can't be angled. So the way the scans are acquired is actually perpendicular to the table, just like axial MR imaging. But they're frequently reconstructed. And so what happens is you see this effect. Here's an MR scan, the patient scan straight. Here's a CT, the patient scanned at an angle, or at least displayed at an angle. And it looks like this lesion is in a different location. That's just because we're looking at the head in a different angle. So this is the angle that CT scans are usually displayed in. This is perpendicular to the table, the way that the scans are actually acquired on most multi-detector scanners and the way they're acquired on MR imagers. So this different in ang difference in angle helps explain why lesions look like they're in different locations on CT and MR scans, but also explains why the artifacts that can arise from the teeth which might be displayed over the posterior fossa appear to come out of nowhere. So again, coming to these artifacts, where do these come from? These are dental hardware. So here's the source image that shows the artifact coming from the teeth. But in this case, you can see when we reconstruct at an angle, it looks like the artifact comes out of nowhere. So be aware on a lot of modern scanners, the images are acquired straight but they're displayed at an angle, which can make it difficult to determine where the artifacts come from. Now, CT images are acquired um, not, increment, not in a single moment, like a snapshot, like you would take on a camera at say a 60th of a second or one two, you know, one two hundredth of a second. These are scanned over a few, uh, multiple seconds. And so that allows enough time that if the patient moves during the acquisition of the scan, we see the motion. This can lead to artifactual alignments and suggest fractures on reconstructions. So here's a spine case reconstruction. It looks like there's a malalignment here at the cervicothoracic junction. This is a very difficult area to see on uh, plain film imaging. But what I wanna uh, show you is if you look at the source image, you can see that there's this double cortex look. So the patient was pretty co cooperative here, but then got uncomfortable or uh, restless and started to move when we got to this level, which gives you this artifactual malalignment. So be careful of this when you're looking at spine imaging because the longer the coverage, the more time it takes to acquire it. In fact, this is such a problem that this was reported uh, in this uh, uh, article in Journal of Neurosurgery, and they were pointing out that this, which was interpreted to be a fracture and malalignment, was merely a patient motion problem. So again, this is a real problem and one that you should be aware of. Now, sometimes it's comical. I mean, this is a scout view of a patient and uh, gives you this kind of fun house look. This patient's moving all during the acquisition of this image. And sometimes it's spectacular. 
again, the patient was uh, not really that cooperative and they're moving around as the scan is being acquired. This is what they look like just a second or two later. Now these look like they're x-ray images, but these are what are called topograms or scalp views. And the way these are done is the scanner, the x-ray tube and the receptor are parked. And then we just scroll through the, uh, through the patient to see if anyone's waiting to log on. Sometimes these malalignments can look like fractures. Here you can see the lateral border of the maxillary fracture. It looks like there's a malalignment here, although honestly it looks similar on the other side. And again, this is motion. Patient moved, it gives you this double cortex appearance. On the source images, this is, means the patient moved just a little bit, see it down here, during the scan acquisition. So it gives you this misregistration of location. Now some of the artifacts are induced by the hardware. We'll sh I'll show you some examples of rings and whirls. These, are, these have to do with the way the scanner is acquired or calibrated. This ring lesion that you see here, this is an artifact uh, caused by a failure of calibration of one of the detectors. Here's another one, multiple rings and uh, usually the center of the image. This is a calibration error. These whirls, like we saw earlier from coming from that metal, these are a feature of helical imaging, particularly with uh, relatively thick slices. And uh, the angle between the veins related to the pitch of the acquisition. But again, these are artifacts caused by the hardware and the reconstruction. Let's see if you can see this. Here you can see, oops. Let's see if that'll run. You can see the whirls as we scan through the top of the head. And this has to do, this frequently is a problem with curved surfaces, usually when, as I say, the slice thickness is relatively thick. Now you might think you wouldn't mistake these artifacts on a scan, but this was a uh, paper from pediatric radiology talking about the effect of an artifact that was seen on multiple scans. And they said in their conclusion, in a fifth of the scans with the artifact were misinterpreted as pathology then half of these led to further action. So again, be careful. They make the point that these artifacts cause false diagnosis and unnecessary imaging. This is particularly important in this era of uh, large co-payments or no insurance because to bring a patient back for a repeat scan uh, at minimum is uh, most uh, policies are gonna be $100 or more for the patient. And sometimes these are all paid for by the patient. Well, that's all uh, I'm going to present today. Again, sorry about that slow start, but I'm learning my way through Zoom. Uh, I want to acknowledge today is the remembrance of the Armenian genocide. And uh, I want to credit the, this uh, Instagram site, Armenian Geographic, for this spectacular photograph of the memorial in Yerevan. And uh, that's the end of my show, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, regarding that uh, topic.